This uh, video is going to be at least a little bit different, actually a lot of it different from all the other videos on this channel. Uh, so I primarily play RuneScape, old school, and uh, yeah, this year was kind of a down year for old school for me, uh, with the combination of Nex being not as cool as it uh, was hyped up to be, or by Jagax, I mean everybody else knew that it wasn't going to be that much fun. And the combination of that with uh, TOA also not being uh, very fun uh, to me personally. Other people may have their own opinions on that. But uh, I ended up playing a lot of different games this year in 2022. So I, I figured I would uh, showcase the games that I played this year. And uh, technically won last year. But uh, yeah, let's get into it. Starting out. Uh, with a game that I'm sure everybody that has ever been in Discord with me is tired of me talking about is uh, Xenoblade Chronicles. Um, so I started the year. I finished this game maybe 10 minutes before the new year passed for 2022. And I kid you not, this game showed me what games could be, or at least reminded me of what games could be outside of RuneScape. After not playing hardly any games other than like RuneScape and Super Mario 64 for just a little bit of speedrunning as a little breakup for RuneScape. For the past like four or five years, I pretty much primarily played RuneScape. For for those of you who don't know what Xenoblade Chronicles is, it's a JRPG game that, at least in gameplay, relies very heavily on some MMO inspired roots. Uh, on the surface, it's very simple to understand, very quick to get into, um, but this game, where it really shines, is its story. The intro cutscene of this game and just the, the sheer spectacle of this really had me hooked at the beginning. And by the time you're three to four hours into this game, you're hooked, man. It is a journey. It's an adventure. It's, it's an epic in, in all senses of the term. And the story revolves around the main character, Shulk. Um, he's a very believable a relatable character for a lot of people. Um, his flaws are very believable, but this game combines a very, very believable story um, and resolve that Shulk has um, all the way through. This game has plenty of plot twists, even some heavily foreshadowed, is still, still work very well. Um, I think in the future, when I do come back to this game, it's gonna be a little hard because the next two games in the series, technically three, uh, really develop this uh, combat system and make it a lot more intense and fluid. It is amazing. If you guys haven't played it, it is the game on this list uh, of all the games this year is probably the game I would suggest the most to anybody that's interested in playing any JRPGs. Hot off the heels of Xenoblade Chronicles 1, I went straight into Xenoblade 2, and my god, this is probably my favorite game of the year. Uh, it didn't come out this year, obviously, but probably my favorite of the year. Uh, while the main story is not as intense as Xenoblade 1's was, uh, where this game lacks the intensity of the main story, it actually makes up for it a ton with the uh, character development and the gameplay. You have Rax, Pyra, and Nia, who were amazing characters, go through a tremendous amount of growth throughout the course of the game. Um, so once you slap in some world-ending bad guys with this world destruction plot of, of sorts, uh, slap in some great music and gameplay, and you got yourself a winner. The presentation of this game is next to none, except for maybe Xenoblade 3, but you have some really vivid regions beautiful colors the world design and the backstory of the world are amazing and i mean that's what you come to expect from current day monolith soft and once you make your way through the uh, the main story of the game you have a ton of post-game replayability and um you have a ton of post-game replayability this allows for grinding for the gotcha mechanic that is very notable about this game but is actually a ton of fun to actually grind out especially coming from like an mmo background it's really nice um you also have the challenge mode and the challenge mode like new game plus and bringer of chaos 
You also have a large number of super bosses uh, alongside these challenge modes, and honestly, this gameplay system is the best. It's the most active. Um, it's probably my favorite in the series as well. It's very active, it's snappy, it's quick. And I actually played this game twice this year. I streamed my second playthrough, which was more of a just like further understanding of the story now that I understood it the first time. But it, going back, you pick up on so many things that you missed on your first playthrough as well, as far as the story goes, any subtle hints that they drop throughout the story. I can't wait to play it again with Bringer Chaos. Uh, the only downfall of this game is that we miss the backstory of a couple characters, but that is completely fulfilled by the DLC for this game, which is uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Torn of the Golden Country. I did consider this its own game. Maybe that's cheating, uh, but it is like a 17 hour adventure. This game focuses on one of your main antagonists in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 being Jin. And it really flushes out uh, his journey and how him and Mithra became the way that they are when you first meet them in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Um, this also introduces my favorite character in the series. Maybe not the series, but my favorite character in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which is Laura. She's great, like super dependable and like optimistic person. It's great. Wants to have a brutality. It's this goody two-shoe character, but she... I don't know why, resonated with me a ton, love her. My only complaints about this game is that the community system that pops up uh, every time is kind of a, a drag and it feels like padding when you have to get community level four for the end game, but it is what it is. Uh, they did change the combat a little bit to be a little bit more active and make a uh, full burst a lot more common, but to me, I still prefer the Xenoblade Chronicles 2, like the base games, combat a little bit more. So at the end of January, uh, after finishing Xenoblade 2, I think I went and killed some Nax on RuneScape, but came back to the Switch for Pokemon Legends Arceus. And I don't know if this is a hot, hot take, but I didn't really care for this game too much. Uh, they kind of butchered my favorite part about Pokemon, which was the battling system and just having trainers to fight. This game was like pretty sparse on that end and some of the damage calculations were way off to me. It's a completely unique Pokemon game. That being said, uh, it is pretty fun in the sense that the, the speed that you can catch Pokemon, the traversal was super fun at the time, and the open world concept was really cool. So I hope they continue to do this moving forward. Not sure if I'll get it at full price again, but it was a decent game. I pretty much dropped this game as soon as I finished the main story of the game. I, I guess like filling the Pokedex out beyond the point of just catching every Pokemon, I just wasn't into. Uh, I understand the research side of it, but it was fine. So after Pokemon, I went and completed uh, Portal, the, the first one. Uh, last year in 2021, Small Arms and I uh, played the two-person co-op on Portal 2. It was a ton of fun, so I just wanted a little bit more of that. Uh, you guys have played Portal. Don't need to uh, say too much. Just fun puzzle game. So I'm going to group these uh, next two games together because I guess it doesn't really matter. Uh, like the timeline for these because they're pretty much the same game. Just a little bit different. So I played uh, Skate 2 and Skate 3. Got to the credits on both of them. Honestly, both of these games are just really good games for me to zone out, flick some sticks, do some really cool like tricks, you know, some grinds of five O's, and then I call everything in the names of BMX tricks because that's what I do. Every skateboarder and BMX rider has like pretty much played these games. So in short, I think it's just best to talk about the differences between Skate 2 and Skate 3. And I'm gonna say that I prefer Skate 3. Um this game has a much more forgiving physics system, which is just a little bit more fun to play with. Uh, the art style is just better in Skate 3, I think. They really leaned on the like retro skate aesthetic in Skate 2, and I think it just hasn't aged well. Um, skate 3 is a lot more vibrant. The camera in Skate 3, so much better. It's higher up. You can actually see where you're going. And honestly, I can't tell you how many times I've beaten Skate 3 from like going back to 
college and playing every year I had a new roommate or something like that. I had to had to beat it on their Xboxes. So after that, we uh, got into Link's Awakening. It's short and sweet. 2D Zelda game. It's actually the first 2D Zelda game I ever beat. I guess I kind of beat Phantom Hourglass when I was a kid, but I had to use cheats to beat it, so yeah, we won't talk about that. Uh, there's not much going on plot-wise. Link was stuck on an island, needs to get home, that's about it. There's the, the very obvious plot spin when you beat the game and understand what's going on. It is kind of hinted at, but if you don't know what it is, I would be surprised, but I'm not going to spoil it here. I mean, it's just good 2D Zelda fun, man. The dungeons are really good. Puzzles, especially the tower with the uh, the wrecking balls you have to drop. It's a really cool dungeon, but it's just Zelda. It's great. So after the Zelda game, I think I had to break for a little bit, but I ended up coming back with uh, two friends of mine, uh, Petrosian and Ladius. We wanted to go through and play all the uh, 2D Metro games, or at least the ones I hadn't played. I don't know if they ever ended up playing the other two. Uh, so we started with Zero Mission, just to go in chronological order. I had previously played uh, Samus Returns on the 3DS in Dread, Metro Dread, the year before. Yeah, Zero Mission was like a good entry point into the 2D world of Metroid. Like, it's pretty hand-holdy. Uh, it's not too difficult. I did do a no charge beam run, challenge run, because uh, I didn't know that that guy wouldn't spawn anymore. But this was a pretty pretty great game to jump in, get your feet wet, and understand how Metro games work uh, straight up. It was a pretty good time, except for the epilogue. That thing can go fuck itself. Wasn't really all that fun. And after Zero Mission, we went all the way back in time to 1995 or whatever year this game came out with Super Metroid. And like, where do you even begin with this game? Everything that could be said about Super Metroid has already been said. So it's super snappy. It's hard to navigate on the first playthrough without any, without a guide or any prior knowledge. The three of us had a had a great time uh, figuring this out, and we actually ended up going through and playing this game a lot afterwards with uh, some multi worlds. I believe they're called Moltroids, but they were super fun uh, co op way to play the game, if you will, with randomizers and stuff like that. But they definitely played a lot more than I did afterwards. I moved on to some other games, but this was a, a great time. And thanks to Lee and Petra for hanging out with me on those games. But yeah, it makes me super excited to uh, play Hollow Knight next year, which I know has has uh, been heavily inspired by Super Metroid. So can't wait to get to that one. <laughs> After Super Metroid, we actually played uh, Metroid Fusion, which in, in the same vein of Zero Mission is like super hand holding. I know that Fusion came out before, but uh, there was some nice quality of life, like the uh, like the ledge grab, if you will, and the cool subplot of the, the X parasites, the defective space command lab branch. Pretty cool. Um, I mean, it's just more 2D Metroid, except super linear. It was fine. So I guess I'm going to jump ahead over a game here, because we're going to go all sorts of out of order from now on, but after playing uh, Metroid Fusion, uh, Lee wanted to play Metroid Prime. And I'm not going to lie, this game didn't jive with me. It was the first 3D Metroid game, and it really kind of shows. I guess uh, the main issues that I have with this game are that Samus doesn't really feel fit. For a more action-oriented game in 3D space, um, the 2D games felt pretty snappy, uh, but in 3D, I'm not sure if it's the camera or just the lack of movement options that Samus really has. She just feels super sluggish, and the aiming feels horrible on GameCube controller. I don't really... the lock-on didn't really seem to work that well, and I think the only other... I have like two other main points of contention is that like the end game artifact hunt is just not that fun uh, If you knew about it like a lot earlier, it would help But I, I know that like half of those artifacts are still locked behind like some of the some of the uh, later power-ups And another thing man, I can't 
I never want to go through Magmore Caverns ever again. I couldn't tell you. I got lost halfway through the game. Again, we didn't use guides. But I must have gone through Magmore Caverns like, I don't know, 80 times. I'm sick of that place. The amount of backtracking in that game was atrocious. Um, and that's saying a lot after playing like Super, Super Metroid. I don't know. Places didn't feel that memorable. The boss fights were horrible. I can't even say that they were like inherently hard. It just felt like you didn't have the tools to deal with the the bosses in like an effective and speedy manner. However, I am excited to actually go and play Metro Prime 2. So right after I came off Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and went into uh, Legends Arceus, pretty much as soon as I finished Legends Arceus, they announced Xenoblade Chronicles 3. And my hype level for Xenoblade at this time was like through the roof. I even went out of my way and bought a Wii U to play Xenoblade Chronicles X. And I didn't get around to playing it, but I was like hype man for Xenoblade at the time. So when they announced Xenoblade Chronicles 3, I was like, I gotta go back. I gotta play all the other Monolith Soft games. And I didn't get to all of them. Like I said, I didn't play Xenoblade Chronicles X and I didn't get the gears. The three games I did get to are Xenosaga episodes one, two, and three. And so it began my history lesson about the Xeno series. Um, I guess I'm gonna group these three together because I don't really think it's fair to talk about the games as individuals as far as a narrative standpoint goes. But these three games, the world that they created was super complex. The plot threads that they send out are, it, like, you can't even count how many plot threads they throw at you in episode one. They just make you care about almost every single one of the characters in the main cast, which is not something you can say about most games, and especially JRPGs in general. Uh, most of the characters are not one-dimensional. They're all very complex. Um, even some of the side characters get more complexity given to them than a lot of other JRPGs. Um, or SRPGs, like we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, so Xenosaga Episode 1, plot-wise, very great. Sets up a lot of questions for the next two games to, to answer, which is like quite the feat. Um, as far as the gameplay standpoint goes, it was okay. You have this button input for going through menus, so like different combinations of different buttons create different like special attacks at the end if you have the the correct amount of action points, which was fine. Uh, I found this game really slow until you get some some proper AOE attacks, and you end up in this weird situation that I felt like all the ether attacks and the eggs units like felt super underpowered or like pretty much useless. So I ended up just using the base characters the whole time through the game. Once you get the uh, you only need two action points to do a special. You just pretty much just burn through everything. Uh, not in an overpowered way, but it makes everything a lot quicker to get through battle. For a game that came out in 2003 in North America, the voice acting is on point. It is so good. Which leads me to our next point when we get to episode 2. Which we're going to dive into right now. They fucked up the voice cast. I was so upset. I did a quadruple take at the screen when I heard Xion and Cosmos talk in episode two, and it wasn't the same voice actors. Uh, they redid the art style to be less anime. Looking back at it, it's definitely the wrong choice. The character models just look wrong, as you can say about like any early PS2 models nowadays, especially like realistic looking models. So I, I think the art style of like the anime aesthetic like helped a lot. The other main issue is that Takahashi, the director of the first game, episode one and Gears, uh, stepped down as the main director. So we ended up in this situation where the new direction of the staff like didn't understand what was going on in um, episode one and didn't understand where we wanted to go to by the end of what was to be originally a six, six game series. As we know, we only got three. So the direction is a little off, um, but it was really nice to like dive into Junior 
who's another one of the main characters, and Obedo, which is one of the the antagonist, and it is super satisfying at the end of the game to like fully understand Junior and his struggles. And really, I mean, I don't want to get into any spoilers, but it was it was a good ending for sure. the The issue that I have with this game is not entirely with the narrative. Um, the gameplay is like super slow. I really like the ambition about like having uh, your your enemies have like weak zones and you break their stance and they you know become weaker but it relies so heavily on the boost system and charging and it just makes regular base encounters like way too long like longer than some of the boss fights which is a real problem and the game isn't necessarily hard so after what was like a failure of episode two we get to arguably you know i'm just gonna say the best of the three games right here which is episode three and it all blowed up to this it has the best gameplay in the series it granted it's more of a like streamlined normal uh jrpg experience but the break system is back you don't have to worry about zones it's just super super clean snappy menus are great uh ether works really well like your magic the es units battles the the mech battles are great has some pretty deep strategy to them for the most part really fulfilling and the best part about this is they kind of fix what xenosaga episode 2 did to the story and really turn it on its head it's a really endearing story it flushes out Xi'an completely uh it turns her from like just a not very like fun character to be with to like super believable um, even Alan gets some shine in this game, which was, he was basically just a punching bag. We also get Helos, who shows up and just absolutely destroys Cosmos at the beginning. And it's like sad. This game rocks. Definitely lived up to like the expectations that Takahashi like originally laid out in Xenosaga Episode 1. It's so worth it. And, I mean, what can I say? I'm a sucker for Takahashi and sci-fi elements and max. So, this game was great. I think about two weeks later, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 came out. And it was, I'm going to say worth the wait. I wasn't waiting as long as people who originally played 2 did, because that came out in 2017. I was only waiting like six months or so and they were waiting five years but this game was great the story great the main cast super relatable uh everybody was likable senna's the best probably the character that i related to the most probably not my favorite character but like i wish they really worked on our ascension story a little bit more i, I keep saying it like the xeno cast motives are like always super believable um it's a super utopian world where you have people fighting for their lives and it's just this never-ending cycle of ouroboros gameplay wise i think this game is like definitely a step up from xenoblade chronicles 1 and i think if you're like a casual with xenoblade 2 it's definitely better but I think it just feels a lot slower than Xenoblade Chronicles 2, if you're being active into. And I feel like there's a really high reliance on the chain attack system in this game, uh, which really slows down the pace. When you chain attack in Chronicles 1 and 2, it's pretty quick, but this, I do like the strategy involved with the chain attack, but it does slow the pace of the game down a lot. Uh, the story on this game is like, I'm not sure if it's, it's probably my favorite story that I, in an individual game for, that I, uh, partake in, in the year. I, it literally made me tear up like three times, but that's, that's a, that's a good JRPG for me. Yeah. I don't really know what to say about this game. The world, 
the the world was beautiful. The areas were were great. It's probably the best looking game on the Switch to come out yet, in my opinion. So the day before Xenoblade Chronicles 3 came out, uh, I actually ended up getting my hands on a PS5. So that thing had to wait until after Xenoblade 3. But uh, the first thing I did on that system was actually play Astro's Playroom. I think a lot of people do that. Uh, it's a really cute, like, throwback to, like, PlayStation's history. And it's more or less just a tech demo for the controller and some of the visual stuff that the PS5 and loading speeds that it can perform are. It's not really too much content to talk about. It's a 3D platform. It's just a good time. And then coming off from a 3D platformer straight into a 2D platformer is probably the tightest 2D platformer I've ever played, which is uh, Celeste. Aesthetically, like the 8-bit the the aesthetic was beautiful. The colors were great. The gameplay was like super good. The fact that when you die, you just instantly try again, like in next to no time was huge. It was uh, super fun. It was pretty challenging. Like, every room is its own, like, little micro-challenge. And then you have the boss fights that are like, hey, take what you've learned from this, and, like, it's a, it's now a marathon, not a sprint. Extra difficulty with the strawberries, stuff like that. It was, honestly, really good game. The story is pretty good. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait to see what these developers do next after Celeste. So I ended up taking a little bit of a break to, you know, do some Tombs of a Masket on RuneScape before getting into this next game. And the next game I played was Triangle Strategy. Let's say the obvious stuff. This HD 2D art style is probably my favorite, like, new art style that's come out in the past couple of years. The game looks great. The gameplay is amazing. It's pretty much the first strategy role-playing game i've played since like advance wars if you even want to call that like an rpg but it is a strategy game and this gameplay was great and honestly it was the only thing keeping me going this game's pacing is atrocious for me this was a 37 hour game ish and it felt like maybe 13 hours of that was actually battling the other 20 plus hours were the story that I don't know, didn't jive with me much. Like, I understand the world and the needs and the three factions, but the characters didn't develop at all. Um, your main character is just this, like, I'm gonna help everybody no matter the cost, like, kind of thing. And, like, it gives you options to be, like, more, more strict, but if you're playing it like I did as a role playing game, like, he wouldn't choose anything but the most beneficial for his people path. That, and you only really care about, like, one other character in this game, which is his, uh, arranged wife. And she... I don't know, she doesn't really have much of a, a character growth either. She ends up being, like, a little bit more self-confident. And that's about it. The story and pacing kind of, like, threw me off. I know that there's three endings. I only did one of the endings, and I'm probably not going back for the other two. The gameplay was great, though. After the barely serviceable story triangle strategy, I went to something without a story. Uh, I went and played Crash Bandicoot 1 and 2 on the Insane Trilogy. Uh, they're fine 2D-ish platformers. I don't really know how to explain them. I, I guess they're 2D on a 3D plane. I don't know. Weird. It's not a ton to say about this. I did have my issues with Crash 1, namely like a camera that would obscure like pitfalls and stuff like that, or like mid jump would change, um, throwing off your trajectory. Uh, other than that, like Crash 2 is pretty much just a better Crash 1 with better pacing, except for those jetpack levels. Those can. Yeah, the jetpack levels can fuck right off, honestly. And next up is probably 
My second favorite game that came out this year was Pokemon Violet. It is by far the most fun I've ever had playing an open beta of a game. Um, this game runs horribly. Uh, graphically, art style wise, is horrendous. It's from from the largest multimedia franchise in the world. You would expect better. That being said, it is the best Pokemon game since Black and White 2, hands down. Uh, the open world design was great. Um, I wish that they had Gym Leader Scout, Scout to your level, based off from how many badges you have. They don't do that. But the, the amount of freedom that you're given, I don't know how to explain it. It's just so whimsical, this whole experience. It, it finally feels like you, you're a, a character that's just been sent out on their their Pokemon journey, and for the first time, it's like, it's actually your choice where you go. It feels like how Pokemon was always meant to feel. This open-ended journey that you're sent on as a kid to fill out the Pokedex, but you, you have the Pokedex, you have the gym challenges, you have the, the Titan sideline, and then you have uh, the Team Star, and... Honestly, none of the storylines were, like, that good until you finished them all and you went into the postgame. The AI professor was, uh, was actually kind of nice. This is, like, by far the funniest Pokemon game, too. There were some points that made me giggle. Beyond that, the battling is, it's just Pokemon. You, you can't complain about it. And I had some fun. I did some competitive, made it up to the Master Ball tier for the boys. And, uh, quit after that. Yeah. Game was fun. So, after Pokemon, I went to a more traditional JRPG game. Um, shout out to my friend Rob for introducing me to this game. Um, we, he has a little book club discord, if you will, that uh, went and played this game. But this game was great. Cold Steel 1, I kid you not, the worst 25 hours of a beginning of a video game I've ever played. Super slow. Uh, the world building could have been summed up super quick, but after that 25 hours when you finally get introduced to like an antagonist and like their motives, and now it changes our motives from being just a school kid, like attending school, to being like, you just have to stop this Imperial Liberation front because clearly up to no good. The last four chapters, I guess, if you want to call the final chapter its own chapter. I thought it was just going to be an epilogue, but it's like 15 hours long. We're just so good. There's a, quite a few plot twists that I didn't see coming. Uh, like, they kind of dangle them in front of you. But you have no idea that they were doing that until, until the end of the game. And it, the game ends on a cliffhanger, which is like what you expect. Because there, there are three more games in this direct arc for the Trails series, but the Trails series is a massive series that I can't wait to continue getting into. This game was a ton of fun. The combat system was quick, snappy, really good, pretty strategic for the most part too. Yeah, great, great 70 hour game to do in a week. After that, I'm going to group these next two games together because they are pretty much the same game, kind of, but I played uh, the collection uh, the Zone of the Enders HD collection. So this is actually a game by uh, Kojima, and I haven't played any of the Metal Gear games, but this does not play like a Metal Gear game. Uh, as they put it, call it High Speed Robot Action, and that is exactly what it is. The very first game's uh, combat, I mean, it's good combat, and it's pretty much going to carry over to the second game. Uh, the issues that I have with the first game is that you pretty much only fight like three different types of enemies, which was very odd to me, other than the bosses. And the combat just feels like you're flying around and like just hacking and slashing at stuff. Like my square button on my controller is fucked. The story of the first game is, I guess to put it short, it feels like the whole thing's on fast forward. But the whole story feels so segmented and just like rushed it feels really weird and i mean leo is just a kid and he acts like a kid throughout this whole story and that brings us to Throne of the unders 2 and this is actually the last game i finished this year um 
And this is basically just a better Zone of the Enders one. Um, so you, you end up as Dingo. The bosses are better. The enemy types are better. The vector cannon is fucking sick. Um, I wouldn't rate this game as like a really good game, but it's definitely better than the first one. Uh, the final bosses are hard, and some of the missions are hard on normal mode. Another thing to be said is that like the art style of two holds up a lot better than one. Without all the pre-rendered cutscenes, they used like these these like anime ask cutscenes because like i don't know they did a really good job the voice acting's a little off but the art style of this game made it age like a ton better than uh zoe one because it was originally a ps2 game i'm only gonna piss you guys off one more time i played sonic adventure one the director's cut and it was a uh, it was mid the the sonic portion of the game it was pretty fun. It was quick. It was Sonic action. And like, I can understand why people like 3D Sonic for that reason. And like that kind of carries over into the, into the Tales campaign too, but pretty much every other one of the campaigns. Knuckles is, was like kind of fun, but the rest of them just suck. And when like two thirds of the game, that's only, it only took me like six hours to beat, kind of just ruined the game for me. I think it, the Sonic portion is good, but it needs a lot of work. It, it acts like an early 3D platformer. Like, the camera is, like, super bad. Like, way worse than Mario 64's, which came out before this game. It makes me hopeful that, like, Sonic Adventure 2 couldn't be any worse. So we will get to that at some point. That covers all the games that I played this year. This video was super different to what I normally produce, so let me know if you liked it.